Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, believed that you shouldn't rebalance a portfolio. He had some really good reasons for arguing that, frankly, you should just leave your portfolio alone and never worry about rebalancing. Hey, everybody, I'm Rob Berger. This is the Financial Freedom Show. In today's video, we're going to take a look at why he believed rebalancing was something you should avoid, and there are some good reasons to actually avoid it. But we're also going to look at some of the advantages of rebalancing. And for those like me who do rebalance their portfolio from time to time, we're going to cover a concept called opportunistic rebalancing. Trust me, it sounds a lot fancier than it really is, but I think it is the best way to go about rebalancing if you decide uh, that's best for you. Before we dive into the topic, a quick announcement. I am launching or relaunching my investment newsletter. It starts uh, going out next Sunday morning. If you're watching this video weeks and months from now, it'll be going out every single Sunday morning, uh, packed with information on retirement and investing, basically stuff that can help you make the most of your money, particularly as it relates to, to retirement. So if that's something of interest to you, you can check out right below this video is a link where you can sign up uh, for the newsletter. It's free and worth every penny. All right. Jack Bogle, why in the world did he not want us to rebalance our portfolio? Well, let me actually show you on the screen here. This is an interview that Christine Benz of Morningstar did with Jack Bogle uh, a number of years ago. He's since passed away uh, not too long ago. Uh, and recall, Christine Benz was on our show. She actually, uh, I interviewed her about uh, the bucket strategy, which she's written a lot about. But in this interview with Jack Bogle, she was talking about rebalancing, and you can see right here, he says, I am in a small minority on the idea of rebalancing. I don't think you need to do it. And he says, the data bear me out because the higher yielding asset is going to be stocks over the long term. Now, what in the world is he talking about? So the idea is this. When we think about rebalancing, often we think about rebalancing between stocks on the one hand and bonds on the other. So for example, let's imagine we have a 70-30 portfolio, 70% in stock ETFs and mutual funds, 30% in bond ETFs and mutual funds. Well, uh, we might have that just perfect in our 401k, IRA, perhaps taxable accounts. And then of course, as the market is open and stocks go up and down in price and bonds go up and down in price and pay interest and so on, uh, our allocation can deviate from our target and, and eventually it will deviate by a lot. So the idea of rebalancing is simply to uh, uh, sell your winners, sell the asset that's gone up in value and use the proceeds to buy the asset that's gone down in value. And the point that Jack Bogle was making is that over the long term, stocks have a higher expected return uh, than bonds. So if we're constantly rebalancing between stocks and bonds, to keep it at our target asset allocation, say 70, 30, or whatever your allocation may be, his point was over the long term, you're actually going to see lower returns. And that may surprise some of you if you've not given this much thought uh, until now. And what I wanna do is actually show you with Portfolio Visualizer what this looks like. So here is um, Portfolio Visualizer. And you can see I've created a portfolio, 60% U.S. stock market and 40% bonds. We could have used a different allocation, but this is fine for now. And Portfolio Visualizer lets you model different rebalancing approaches. And we're going to start with uh, annually, which I think is probably the most common uh, for individual investors, certainly not the only reasonable approach. If we analyze this portfolio, uh, we can see that from 1972 to, to 2021, so we'll call it 50 years, $10,000 grew into a million bucks, $984,000. That was rebalancing annually. I will tell you, since I've run all these numbers, that between the different rebalancing approaches, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually, quarterly turns out to have the highest portfolio uh, balance at the end. You can see here, not dramatically higher, but about 10, well, I guess $13,000 higher. So just under a million bucks. However, if we take the Jack Bogle approach and we say, you know what, we're not going to rebalance at all. What happens to our million dollars? Well, instead, we have $1.1 million. So at least based on this 50-year period and the 60-40 portfolio that I've put into Portfolio Visualizer, uh, Jack Bogle it was absolutely right 
rebalancing to keep the portfolio at a 60 40 allocation still has a great outcome i mean ten thousand dollars into a million bucks uh, ain't bad but had you not rebalanced uh, you would have had uh, 1.1 million dollars instead now that's not the end of the story as you might imagine and there are some really good reasons i think to rebalance we're going to get to that in a minute but there's one other thing uh, that jack bogle pointed out about rebalancing particularly for those like me who have investments in taxable account and that is that rebalancing can trigger taxes and that can be yet another reason to avoid rebalancing so in addition to uh, dampening returns as you sort of keep your asset allocation between stock and bonds you know consistent again in our example 60 40 on top of that the potential taxes that rebalancing can trigger trigger he was of the view yeah, that you shouldn't rebalance. He was happy to just leave the portfolio alone and let it drift wherever uh, the markets took it. That was his approach. Now, having said all of that, I think that there are still some really good reasons to rebalance. And the first one is this. You pick an asset allocation, that is stocks to bonds, for a reason, right? You, maybe your allocation is 70, 30, 80, 20, 90, 10, whatever it might be. You've picked that for a reason in part because it was the risk, the volatility uh, that you could tolerate. You didn't want to risk your portfolio if, for example, you chose 80% stocks and 20% bonds. There was a reason you avoided a 90, 10 portfolio or a 100% stock portfolio. And rebalancing between stocks and bonds allows you to keep uh, the portfolio that you originally intended rather than letting stocks sort of overtake the portfolio over time and, and move you into a riskier, more volatile uh, uh, asset allocation. And let me show you what that looks like. We'll go back to Portfolio Visualizer and we can all look at this $1.1 million number. Yes, we I think we'd all agree that's uh, a better outcome than the million dollar number, but we have to recognize there's no free lunch. And if we look at the um, assets of this portfolio, we can see right here, this section, it's portfolio return decomposition. When we look at the portfolio at the end of the 50 years, we can see that the US stocks uh, account for about a million dollars and bonds account for about 100,000. So what does that mean? It means that the portfolio started 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, but, but when we didn't rebalance, it drifted all the way up to 90% stocks, roughly, and 10% bonds. In other words, it became a lot more uh, risky of a portfolio. Its volatility was much more uh, significant as a 90-10 portfolio than a 60-40 uh, portfolio. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with a 90-10 portfolio. And in fact, uh, I used that rough allocation for many years, but if that's what you want, why start with 60-40, right? Just start with 90-10. Why start with 60-40 and then let your portfolio uh, 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 drift? If you want a 60-40 portfolio because that's the risk uh, that you think you can handle, then what rebalancing between stocks and bonds will do is maintain that risk profile for you. And perhaps you're willing to forego some potential higher returns in exchange for a less a volatile portfolio. That's the first thing that I think is uh, in favor of uh, rebalancing. The second thing uh, relates specifically to retirement. Uh, I'm not a believer of a 100% stock portfolio. Frankly, that's generally true even when you're accumulating money for retirement, but certainly in retirement, I just think it's far too risky. And I don't want my portfolio drifting in that direction. Uh, in my case, uh, we're currently at roughly 80-20, sort of gradually and probably moving to more like 70-30 uh, over time. But once I've got that, port, that allocation locked in, I don't want it drifting higher. I want that 30% of fixed income and cash because uh, that gives me um, security. That gives me money to spend in the, in the near term. That's what the cash is for. Uh, I, don't, I don't follow the bucket strategy. I rebalance based on percentages, and we'll come to that in a minute. But I want that fixed income uh, to help me as I spend money in retirement. Now, having said that, there are some that have argued even in retirement, you should let your portfolio drift uh, and have it become riskier 
over time. That's a topic for another video, but I can tell you Michael Kitsis uh, and Dr. Wade Fowle have both proposed that option. So it is out there. It's just not one that I have at least so far uh, embraced. The third thing, and that's this, the concept of opportunistic rebalancing. I mentioned that at the beginning of the video. You can actually increase your potential returns with a certain type of rebalancing. Now, remember, Jack Bogle was talking about rebalancing between stocks on the one hand and bonds on, on the other. And that's important to understand because stocks have a very high expected return as compared to bonds. Fair enough. But what about rebalancing between different stock asset classes? For example, rebalancing between a U.S. stock index fund and an international uh, stock index fund or, or between a developed international markets index fund and emerging markets. We could add in small cap. We could add in REITs, maybe commodities for some of you. What about rebalancing between these stock asset classes that all have fairly high expected returns, certainly when compared to bonds? Well, what the studies show is that if you rebalance in the right way, you can actually uh, potentially, no guarantees as we know, but potentially increase uh, your returns. And that gets us to the concept of opportunistic uh, rebalancing. Now, to put it into some context, one way to rebalance, as we saw with Portfolio Visualizer, is to just do it based on time. Every quarter, rebalance. Or you know, twice a year, when the times change and you change the battery and your smoke detectors, you could rebalance. Or perhaps once a year, uh, you could rebalance. The problem uh, with that approach is, uh, one, you may not need to rebalance. Maybe your asset classes haven't deviated that much. And rebalancing, just because it's the end of the year, may not always be the best. Also. When we have significant uh, bear or bull markets, like for example, we had the, the, the bear market from the, the, pan, the COVID pandemic last year, followed by a, a bull market, there could have been real um, uh, opportunities to rebalance during uh, those significant swings in the market. And if you were just rebalancing once a year, you would have missed that opportunity. So what uh, opportunistic rebalancing says is, look, let's forget the time. That's not really our main focus. It can be part of this. But our main focus is let's rebalance when an asset class deviates from our plan by a certain percentage. That's the basic idea. And the paper on this, and I'll show it to you now. Uh, here it is. And I'll leave a link to this below the video. And I may do a future video that goes into far more detail on this concept, but I'm going to give you enough now so you understand uh, the concepts. Um, and to understand opportunistic rebalancing, we need to understand basically two things, what are called rebalancing bands and tolerance uh, bands. And so to show you how this works, we're gonna go to the whiteboard for a second. Let's imagine we, we'll just use the three fund portfolio as an example, and we'll assume in the three fund portfolio, we have US stocks, and uh, we have 50% allocated to U.S. stocks. Maybe it's a Vanguard, VTI, ETF, for example. So if we imagine a graph, we'll put 50% here. This is our allocation. And what the paper that I just showed you a moment ago says is this. Let's do this. We're going to add 20% um, to, to our allocation, and we're going to subtract 20%. So what's 20% of 50? Well, it's 10. So we're going to add 10 to this. So that would give us 60%. And we're also going to subtract 10. So that gives us 40%. And these represent the outer bands, what I've called rebalancing bands. And what we're going to do is we're going to rebalance whenever our U.S. stock allocation either goes above 60% or below 40%. Until then, we're going to leave it alone. So for example, if it's just hovering around here, maybe it goes up here and then goes down and does what stocks do, we're going to leave all that alone. We, we're, we don't need any of that. We're not going to rebalance in that situation. We're only going to rebalance when it either goes up and crosses the upper rebalancing band of 60%, or maybe it goes down and crosses the bottom rebalancing band of 40%. So that's how the rebalancing band works. That's what's going to trigger rebalancing. Now, that's the first part of opportunistic rebalancing. The second thing relates particularly to taxable accounts. And it asks this question. If rebalancing gets triggered, let's just assume it gets triggered because it goes down. 
So what that means is we're going to sell some other asset class, probably bonds in this case, but whatever it may be, and we're going to use it to buy stocks. The question is, do we need to get it back up to exactly 50%? Do we need to be really, really precise with this? And um, what the author said in the opportunistic rebalancing paper is, particularly in taxable accounts, absolutely no. Particularly if trying to get super, super precise is going to trigger a bunch of taxes. And so what he came up with, and others have written about this as well, um, are called tolerance bands. And it said, okay, we don't have to get exactly to 50% in this example, but how close do we need to get? It's kind of like a game of horseshoes or hand grenades, right? You know, close enough is okay. Well, how close do we need to get? And he defined the tolerance bands as half the rebalancing bands. So in this case, the rebalancing bands were 10% either way. So the, the tolerance bands are going to be 5% either way. So I'll just draw a dotted line. So this would be what? This would be 45%. And the upper tolerance band up here would be 55%. There you go. And so if we're rebalancing, particularly in a taxable account, remember in a retirement account, I suppose you could rebalance back to the penny if you wanted to, because you know taxes aren't an issue. But for those of you with taxable accounts, the idea is we'll rebalance it just so it gets up to this tolerance band. If we get to there, uh, we're, we're okay. We don't need to, to, to trigger more taxes to get it all the way up to our, our target allocation. We can just get it within this tolerance band. And that's it. It's just really as simple as that. And just to drive the point home and to show you how this works, let's use our 20% bonds as another example. We would do the same thing. We're going to add um, uh, 20%. So what's 20% of 20? It's 4 so our upper band will be 24%. Our lower band will be 16%. Right? It's going to work the same way. It's just the numbers are a little different. And our tolerance bands will be half, right? So we can just do dotted lines as an example. And this is going to be 22%. And this is going to be 18%. And that's it. And we just monitor um, our asset classes in the three fund portfolio. Very, very easy to do. It gets more complicated as you slice and dice your portfolio. For the, those of you with like 18 different asset classes and funds, yeah, it's a lot of work, which is one of the reasons I prefer simple portfolios. But in any event, you'll do this for each of your funds, each of your asset classes. And um, the nice thing is, is that you notice the rebalance bands and tolerance bands uh, either get bigger or smaller depending on your starting allocation. And I think that's how it should be. And, um, and it's a great way to think about rebalancing. And what I do is just monitor my portfolio. I'm looking at it, you know, uh, daily, certainly, if not at least weekly. And I'm looking for opportunities uh, to rebalance when one of my asset classes breaches the uh, rebalancing band. And I have a tool that can help you actually do that. And we've talked about it before. Let me show it to you. It is right here. This is the uh, um, in, uh, investment tracking spreadsheet. I've done a separate video on it. I'll leave a link to, to the article, which you can see here. This is the article that I've written on my site um, with a link uh, to uh, the spreadsheet right here. And um, the thing that I want to show you is this. Here are where all the holdings go. This is just an example. And then the tab that's by asset class kind of summarizes all of the holdings. And you'll notice that you can put your target asset allocation right here. You may or may not have all of these asset classes. You might just have U.S. stocks, international stocks, and, and bonds. That's fine. But you can put whatever your target allocation is here. The, the actual allocation is calculated based off of the numbers you see in this sheet. And you have to put in how much shares you own of each fund. And then what it will do is it'll show you what the difference is. And I've put in thresholds. And as you can see, the thresholds um, are 10% of the target. So 25%, for example, excuse me, not 10%, 20%. So the target's 25%. 20% of that number is 5%. 20% of 10 is 2% and so on. And the thing I like about the spreadsheet is um, if the threshold is breached, you can see here, for example, 3.2% is higher than 2%, it turns red. It's kind of a very easy way to see when an asset class has gone above or below uh, your threshold. I find this spreadsheet 
uh, to be the easiest tool I've found to, to sort of monitor rebalancing. You know, I love um, Personal Capital's dashboard. I love their asset allocation tool, among, among other things. But when it comes to rebalancing, I actually find that spreadsheet to be a much easier way to go. So listen, I know I've thrown a lot at you today. I hope it's helpful to you as you think through how you want to rebalance. Who knows? Maybe you'll take the Jack Bogle approach and just say, eh, I'm not going to bother with it. Or you may take a very, very simplified approach and just rebalance once a year. Wouldn't be the end of the world. Or if you're like me, uh, maybe the opportunistic a rebalancing is a better approach. I really think, particularly for those with significant investments in taxable accounts, you really ought to consider the opportunistic rebalancing uh, approach. It's something, by the way, that Jack Bogle does mention. In fact, in the interview uh, that I showed you, and I'll leave a link to it below the video, he talks about rebalancing bands. He doesn't use the term opportunistic rebalancing, uh, but it's the same concept. Well, listen, I hope this helps. If you have any questions at all, Leave them in the comments below the video. I'll be happy to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.